Good afternoon. Um, thank you to the organizers of this um, symposium. Um, it's really exciting, and I don't say that often about a symposium. Um, I also wanted the last and the first word in our, our kind of pair presentation. Um, Um, okay, so Christian's prepared a presentation of one specific project that he contributed to the Manifesta 7 exhibition, um, which was in northern Italy. As probably most of you know, maybe, Manifesta is the European biennial of contemporary art, which started in the mid-1990s. Um, the most recent Manifesta, um, 10, was staged or opened November, uh, just very recently, in St. Petersburg in collaboration with the Hermitage Museum, hosted by the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. Um, that is, after the Winter Olympic Games, it's contemporary art for Mr. Putin. Um, so today, uh, we're considering, for this presentation, this idea of artistic research as a potentially um, a distinct research methodology or a mode of producing knowledge for a field that we're considering here called urban humanities, which roughly, loosely, combines design, urban studies, humanities, dot, dot, dot. I think for me, um, humanities primarily is interested in meaning and meaning making, meaningfulness. Um, so in addition to all the issues that come up around the urban, which already got registered, the political economy, geopolitics, etc., that the issue of meaning is um, perhaps what is of um, specific to artistic research possibly or humanities more broadly that could be uh, brought to the conversation. In the description in one of these um, uh, pamphlets, it identified, I thought indirectly, artistic research as a non-empirical process. That, um, that somehow the artistic is the other space beyond the empirical modes of research. But as we'll probably see with Christian, um, art takes everything in. It's also empirically oriented as well. Um, Christian Philip Mueller's work, I think, proposes that certain modes of contemporary art may already be a paradigm of urban humanities practice. And that's in part why I suggested that he be the speaker in the symposium. And by certain mode of contemporary art practice, uh, I'm not saying that all contemporary art would kind of fit into this um, uh, conversation. <coughs> Certainly, Jeff Koons, I don't know, would not be the model I would put forward. <laughs> Very particular types of practice of contemporary art, I would say project-based, site-oriented, context-specific, um, and research-based is the kind of contemporary art that I'm thinking about, and I think Christian is an exemplary practitioner in this regard over now decades of um, pursuing, um, pursuing it. Um, in brief, this is a kind of production of artworks that do not exist in advance, that you know, may simply then transport it to a site of presentation, um, which is to say it's not a kind of traditional object-based uh, artistic production. But it's the kind of art practice that is generated and produced by and at the site of presentation. The production of the artwork, as well as a decent understanding of that work, requires then engaging very deeply with the site in many multiple dimensions. That is the physical condition of the site, the social, economic, historical, political, and of course aesthetic. And much of this kind of art in the past, I would say, 30, 40 years has found opportunities of presentation and production in city-based temporary exhibitions, um, perhaps more so than the public art arena, which now is becoming very different of arena production than these kinds of large, um, what some people call mega exhibitions, like Documenta or Sculpture Project, Manifesta, um, biennials, art fairs, etc. Um, Christian's art has dealt with spatial politics very broadly of territories for a long time. And for those interested, a lot of his work that deals with border crossings, um, literal, physical you know, crossing of national borders, but also botanical crossings of borders, um, culinary crossings of borders. Um, um, 
But no matter what kind of project, I've always found consistent that his work responds to and critiques, interrogates, not just the stage that's given to him, that is, the city, the town, the museum, but also and often the very conditions of the exhibition itself, always finding ways to reveal the um, history as a living presence um, in, the, in the moment of the production of the work. And in that process, always, I think, he brings a sense of the political strangeness and the poignancy and humor and humanity in the details of that given situation, of that given site. So with that as kind of a broad intro for um, Christian's practice, as in general, um, we'll bring him to the stage to talk about this one project. And I'll come back to my last Thank you, Mimon, for this very generous introduction, and thanks for the organizers of this conference for including me. Let me see if I can attach it. <laughs> yeah, and I'll hold it like Mimon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, uh, occasion was the seventh edition of Manifesta, a show that has been financed by the European community. And if any of you have any people interest, there's a book uh, published by a family called The Manifesto of the K. The show was always considered to take place in the kind of fringe regions of Europe, not the very part of Europe. And now with the 10th edition going to St. Petersburg, and the 11th edition planned for Zurich in Switzerland, where I'm from, I have a Swiss passport, but I studied in Germany. So these questions that were at the beginning, you know, with the, the show went to Ljubljana, for instance, the, the site always was of very, very high interest to the organizers of these uh, manifesta shows. And uh, there was one about uh, art and pedagogy in Cyprus that couldn't take place. And after that, I think the conclusion was not to just hire uh, one curator or a curatorial team, but actually for Manifesta 7 they hired three curatorial teams. And I was uh, in the one um, located furthest south. Uh, you have to know that this region of Italy called Alto Adige or South Tyrolia is the most prosperous in Italy. So they have a kind of like semi-autonomous status within Italy. They uh, are mostly German speaking. And uh, but Anna Budak, the Polish curator who works now in Prague at the National Museum, um, got this uh, most southern city of uh, Rovarenko. And we're gonna look at this first slide. Uh, it's obviously a very small town that, under the Austrian government that ruled that part of Italy, uh, it was the center of government. But when the, when the Austrians retrieved, uh, Rovereto lost its importance. So it's a rather smallish town, and uh, the, the Manifesta and the Buddha selected two sites, one in the center of town, and one in the kind of, I would call it, periphery, or suburbs. And, uh, oh, I can't walk. But it's like if you, if you, uh, you see the region is really uh, dominated by, oh, this one, oh, very good. How does it work? <laughs> okay, so this is the center of town where we have the church, you know, the kind of uh, palace of governance, and then you have this diagonal line, and that was our site, you know. So not in the center, but not even in the center of Europe, in the periphery. But then this is this um, this is one of the most important north-south axes in Europe, that where all the northern Europeans go to Italy on vacation. But it's a kind of like forgotten town, and all of a sudden they got the one-third of Manifesto, organized by a Polish curator. Uh, here is the site, a former manufacturing place for cigarettes, next to a very grand church. Um, so, as normal, artists get invited, and then they get invited to a site visit, because one has no, no idea what this place is about. 
I had done a um, previous project for a winery, uh, but that was still in the German-speaking part of the body chain. Um, the region is known for its good food, good wine, and you pass through. You don't spend any time there. It's all the way to Verona, to Lake Garda, to Venice. You know, you, all you guys probably have been at the Architecture Biennial. Um, you don't stop there. So why should you want to stop? So there's this defunct factory. Uh, we, are, we were invited for a site visit. There were still some people working, and it's a, no, it's a normal case for contemporary artists. You know, former sites of production are being, being deserted on the outskirts of cities, and then to bring in new life, what should we do? We do a show. We do a big show. So in, in the case of Manifesta, also not to be losing too much time, but it's a case that basically the regions apply to the head of Manifesta, which is located in Poland. But the finances come from the European community. And it's basically a show about Europe. It's many faces of Europe. So that is one of the rooms we saw that what people left behind, kind of very sad, you know, kind of leftovers, and within these kind of strangeness, you know, there were still some bookkeeping, people were still there, some managers were still there, but the production has gone, has stopped. I found this. Artists are, in my case, as Mio Mancon introduced me as a kind of site-specific artist, we're, you know, I'm part of this group of artists. We are known for not having a studio, kind of post-studio practice. We are not producing a work in advance like spec architecture, but we actually produce custom-made, <laughs> which is in itself not doesn't mean that it has to be per se critical. But basically, what curators expect us to do to come and analyze the site and then to find the cure. <laughs> so I found this cigarette. I don't know if you can read Russian, but it, it's basically I give you the translation. I was, I said, this is beautiful. I was struck by the design. I said, what does it mean, Apollo Soyuz? Apollo is American, Soyuz is Russian. What, what do these two mean on the same packaging? And then I turn it on the side and it said produced by Philip Morris in Moscow. <laughs> I didn't understand the world anymore. <laughs> I said, what is this? <laughs> I'm in this kind of strange region of Italy and I'm invited to a former site of cigarette production and the, the, the curators and the curatorial team explained to us the kind of like brutal aspect of this work that the, that the mostly female workers came from the mountainous regions they brought they killed children they were locked up they the workers were locked up and they were paid by the amount of cigarettes they were producing each day but it's a too long a story but it's a very sad place and um, on, on, at the same time the curator and the buddha told us yeah but they have this incredible archive in this small town and the fantastic museum called M-A-R-T, Mark, built by Mario Botta. But it has one problem, it doesn't have a facade, so people don't know it exists. It just has a circle of courtyard, but down in the basement is the most fantastic archive of Futurist art. You artists should go and research it. <laughs> so we have, we have two things you have to deal with, the site and then this archive, the, ar the curatorial wish. So uh, what I did as next step, I was diving into that archive and I uh, looked up uh, at one particular regional artist and that artist was a kind of, not a futurist from the first moment on, he was from this mountainous region, he went to Rome, he got friendly with the other futurist artists, but basically he was a he adopted futurism. And then, at some point, futurism didn't work out anymore in Italy. So he said, oh, I'm going to New York. I'm going to America. So he opened a futurist restaurant 
and he wants to bring food tourism to the States. And what I did find in this archive was his handwritten diary, how he failed, how the Americans just would not buy food tourism. So what did he do? He went back. He went back to his region. He went back to this hometown of Roberto and founded the house of futurism. And where he had first been against history, against the past, against everything that's traditional and crafty, he then married futurism with traditional clothing, with wood carving, with weaving, with crafts. And the house of futurism is now open again. When we did the show, it was closed for renovation. Anyway, in these archives, I did not only find the kind of diary of his failures in, uh, to bring futurism to the state, or to make it widely popular, but also uh, his going back and his kind of theories and writings on how to marry futurism with uh, regionalism. And basically, he founded the uh, Festival of the Grape, and I was trying to find connections between this archive, the city, and this futurist. And what I found is that he had designed a uh, float for a festival of the grape that he invented, and he wanted to make uh, uh, um, this avant-garde movement that was against everything of being local, traditional, but instead was for the lightness of speed, as you all, I don't need to explain futurism to you, but basically he turned futurism on its head. And for this place, his homecoming, he founded this festival of the grape, and he produced a lavish brochure, which I studied, and I have some quotes that you will see later in the video, this short little video that in a way is a resume of this whole project. So, the reason why, and I also have to tell you that the motto for this, this uh, manifesta was the principal hope. So, one of the quotes of Fortunato de Perro was, artists always like to be alive and present where enthusiasm necessitates activism, faith and mirth. Another quote uh, of, uh, that I found in this archive of Pepero was, or his artists are irreparably needy for an unavoidable destiny, but they are also unavoidably men of impulse, readiness, and indestructible faith. So um, I basically tried to recreate a flow that he designed for this tobacco factory plant uh, in 1936. And for that reason, I went to Tuscany. In Tuscany, they have not only nice beaches, in the winter they have dead season. So they invented carnival at the same time as uh, futurism. And they uh, received over a million visitors. And they're out of old newspapers, newspapers and some wire, chicken wire. They make gigantic floats, as you see here one. There's an arena where there's a, a group of men, mostly men, not women, who produced these floats just for carnival in Viareggio. So I then did uh, my production there. And because uh, I, uh, you will later see the, the original float that they throw inside. So I was looking at different ways of producing and showing power during a parade. So this is obviously <laughs> a very famous date, it's not Paris, May 68, now it's Moscow, May 68. And I don't want to really know what's inside this. <laughs> uh, there's a whole other rocket here being shown and created around town. But basically for the media, this is to fool us, the Westerners. This is actually the real thing that you saw pictured on the package of cigarettes. Apollo Soyuz is still one of the ten most popular cigarette brands in the, in the uh, I was going to say USSR, but now you have to say Russia or Russian Federation. What is the proper name? Anyway, so this is what was depicted as a kind of very, to me, very cool packaging uh, one can visit in Washington as the real thing. Um, when I found the cigarettes, I wouldn't believe that these that, that was a real event. And I said, how can communism and capitalism meet? 
it's like oil and water, they don't mix. They don't go together. But these astronauts and commonauts actually have to do some trainings, and you see the little model that you saw earlier on the packaging. And here, you see that this very confined, you know, exchange between the two systems, communism and capitalism. Border crossing, of course, but what you, what you don't see on this diagram uh, is that what these people, cosmonauts and astronauts, they don't even share the same name, what they were breathing was lethal one to the other. So they had to create this docking module where they would exchange and mix at the air so that it would be not lethal to, them, to either one of them. Uh, and that's the very narrow space, imagine, that was, that was taking place in 1975 in, the, in July over Germany, talking about borders. And here you see the cosmonauts and astronauts astronauts training to be nice to each other. Because what do you do when you have a rendezvous? Obviously they don't sleep, they don't sleep with each other, but they have a nice meal. So they're being nice to each other. 1975, imagine. It was conceived in 1972 by a certain Mr. Nixon. And here is finally what I found in the archives. I did not only find the sketches, and the, and the entire descriptions and the, the kind of concept of this parade and how to marry regionalism, traditionalism with futurism, but I actually found a float. And this float was made for the cigarettes that were produced in our exhibition sites from Manifesto 7. And I said, how can you marry this kind of like, what is it, like a rocket like? It's kind of like a, um, the, the cigarettes look like cannons. What is it like? Uh, what is it? What is it? And it's and then that you have this name Monopoly. What what is this all? And what do these kind of little <laughs> wars have to do with cigarettes? I have no idea. But anyway, you will see in the video how it all comes together. Actually, I found a song, uh, an Indian song called Apollo Soyuz, that is a kind of soundtrack for this little video clip, and. So I had this papier mache Apollo Soyuz uh, space rendezvous created in Tuscany, uh, parade through town. And what is the public for such a, for such a show? There were over 3,000 press people announced for the opening. So that's my uh, public, of course. So they're always like in Venice at the Biennale. There's the kind of preview week where all the go, all those in the know, all the professional people, and then you have the official opening with all the politicians, the speeches, you're going to see that also as a sideline on the, in the video, uh, where all the people who are in architecture, in art, long gone. So you basically, as an artist, one learns in many years that your main public is not the public that actually lives in this city, but it's actually the press. But in a way, I wanted to make a project that, like, this unlikely meeting of communism and capitalism in space is like contemporary art and this little town in Italy. They, there was no communication, there was no way to bring the two together, um, and the, my kind of recreation of this float was not a whole entire parade, it was just like this one float that paraded not in the center of town, but it was connecting the kind of periphery to the center of town, the two different sides of the exhibition. And here you see that not only did futurism go uh, towards regionalism and traditionalism, but it also went towards fascism. So all Fortunato de Pro's friends designed these floats and the kind of hand moves and this I don't need to explain it to you. Um, year 1936. And in this uh, brochure for the uh, parade, there's actually a, a work that had a poem for uh, uh, Mussolini. And she was a, a, the, a one worker of the factory, of the, the cigarette factory plant. She wrote this poem. And I combined, I mean, a collage of these different theories and the, the different uh, uh, 
um, thoughts about the manifesta and about uh, this uh, festival of the grave and the kind of ideas and utopian ideals of the futurists and uh, printed it on these orange sluggers, my choir that I had hired folded them into paper airplanes. And for the, so you have these three dates, 1936, the, the date of the parade, 1935, the date of the meeting in space, <coughs> excuse me, at 2008, the actual opening and the year of Manifesto 7. And after the show opened, and all the festivities uh, were done with, the leftover for the duration of the show was the float, the empty float. And now I would like to invite you to enjoy this short little video. We can turn down the light. And uh, then we want to go. Mid July 1975. An American Apollo spacecraft and a Soviet Soyuz spacecraft prepare to join in Earth orbit, 140 miles above the Atlantic near Portugal. Apollo Houston, I got two messages for you. Moscow is go for docking. Houston is go for docking. It's up to you guys. Have fun. Less than five meters distance. Three meters. Three meters. Contact. Capture. During their two-day joint flight, astronauts and cosmonauts transferred between spacecraft. They conducted space experiments, and they tested a compatible rendezvous and docking system, evaluating its potential as the universal standard on future spacecraft for docking and rescue. When we opened hatch in space, we were opening back on the Earth, a era in the history of man.